strength arise, strength He's giving us strength. He's giving us strength today. The strength for us. Strength for us. Strength for us. Strength for us. He's giving us strength. Strength today. Give birth to prophesy. God magnify their ministry. Should the rise break through barriers, run over walls, strength. This hour is giving us strength. can make it strong. decision ministry it's a valley of decision ministry when you hear this ministry you have to decide in that moment The wind to break down impossibilities, the wind to believe beyond.
was saying 18. I remember our first trip to Jerusalem. I bought a little shirt as a souvenir, and it just looked cool. I didn't even know what it meant. It was just like this Hebrew little something word. And I go, that's a cool shirt. I'm going to buy that. I'm thinking it just means something good. And then what one of the locals, I asked him, hey, what does this mean? They go, well, that's the number 18. And I go, what does that mean? They said, it means life. still have the shirt, it just doesn't fit anymore. And all of your, all of your prayers spoke, agreed, the Spirit was already unifying us, it, the prayers were in agreement with what I'm preaching this morning, because I may be preaching on the harlot Babylon and the prepared bride. Um, as you guys were praying over me I, and I went down I just the Lord was showing me just um, like a movie screen before my eyes of my past 16 years at, at IHOP and you know my heart cry was Lord deliver your bride from the spirit of harlotry because the spirit of harlotry is in our midst and for a minute because there's so much in my heart Holy Spirit you know what we need to hear today Lord you're reminding me that the day that I was at Shiloh kneeling down by the lake because you told me to throw my wedding ring in the lake you told me to spread my husband's ashes there and Lord you had given me a dream of Hosea 6, Hosea 5 and 6, Lord, you had given me a dream that you wanted to wake up your bride, that you wanted to deliver her from a spirit of harlotry. Lord, the, your church has been enticed by the things of this world. Your, your church has been enticed by the spirit of harlotry that's actually fueling the harlot Babylon system. Lord, your word says, come out of her, my people. Don't touch her. Lord, your word declares, come out of her. And Lord, we thank you that Hosea prophesied that in that day there will be a people that will no longer know you as master, but they will know you as my husband. And that you are going to have a prepared bride. Lord, we thank you that your word is true. Lord, our heart cry is because of the reality of Matthew 25 that you said there would be five wise virgins and five unwise. Lord, that, that half the church didn't take the time to get the oil. And that half of your people, you said, I didn't even know them. Lord, we can know of you. And we know, according to Hosea 5, that that spirit of harlotry, we can even have words and knowledge of you but not know you personally and Lord there's a lot of the body of Christ that know of you right now but they don't know you and so Lord I remember when I was kneeling at Shiloh throwing my wedding ring in the lake you grip my heart to cry out from Hosea 2. You grip my heart to cry out for the body of Christ. Lord, I thank you for the heart cry in this room that this is a company of people that we are going to step into revival. Lord, you were reminding me of 2015. Lord, when you led the POH team, you led us to pray through Forerunner Church. You, you led us to anoint every chair with oil. You, you led us to prophesy in an empty room, but over the microphone, Hosea 6, that, that there would be a call to repentance, to turn away from that harlot spirit. All the 
little subtle things that entice the human heart, that entice the human emotions, that seduce your people into lesser pleasures, that seduce your people into putting their heart trust into idols, into lesser things. So Lord, I pray that you would awaken us today, that you would show us anything that still captivates our hearts, anything that we cling to for ultimate security that's not you. Lord, search us in Jesus' name. I spoke at a church a few weeks ago and um, and the Lord, a, f a couple days before, just kind of gave me a outline of some Bible references, and he took me kind of a different route for talking about the bridal identity, and he had me start in Revelation 19. I want to read it. It was interesting as, as I was at home reading through it, I feel like it was Rhema, so that's what was really happening. My spirit caught it. But it was, it, it was experiential. I felt like I was in it. I was seeing it. And so I was seeing, you know, it's, it's, I'm going to read the whole passage. It's the prepared bride. The bride's prepared herself. But as I was reading through it, all of a sudden I started weeping for myself, even though I know that I'm solid <laughs> in my relationship with the Lord. It was like this, for myself and for the body of Christ, that they wouldn't miss it because there's an enticing system rising up that's going to seduce the nations and there's a great falling away that's taking place. And so Revelation 19 says, after these things, I heard something like a loud voice of a great multitude in heaven saying, Alleluia, salvation, glory and power belong to our God because his judgments are true and righteous for he has judged the great prostitute who is corrupting the earth with her sexual immorality, and he has avenged the blood of his bondservants on her. And for a second time, they said, Hallelujah, her smoke rises forever and ever. You know, when I was a kid, before I got saved, that verse, her smoke arises forever and ever, I kept having this reoccurring dream. I was like two or three years old, and I could still see it in my mind to this day. And I wasn't saved yet. It, it's what actually led me to salvation. I would have this reoccurring dream, and I would see this smoke arising. And I would see people actually being dragged to hell as well. But it terrified me. It was powerful, but it terrified me. And it led me to going to my mom and saying, I need Jesus. She led me, she led me to the Lord. And I remember <laughs> it went from that reoccurring dream to... The night I accepted Jesus, I, it, was, it wasn't a vision, it was, it was real. In real life, I saw my hallway filled with angels. It was the, he's the Lord of hosts, thousands upon thousands we have on our side. And so the end time bride is well covered. But, but I was always gripped because throughout my life, I would, I would have flashes of that dream come, back, come through my mind of what's coming. And, and now, at my age, and knowing the Bible and the bride needing to be prepared and the seriousness of this harlot system that's rising up, there's a reality, and it's going to unfold quickly. So her smoke rises forever and ever. And the 24 elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshiped God, who sits on the throne, saying, Amen, hallelujah. And the voice came from the throne saying, give praise to our God, all you his bondservants, you who fear him, the small and the great. Then I heard something like the voice of a great multitude and like the sound of many waters and the sound of mighty peals of thunder saying, hallelujah, for the Lord our God almighty reigns. Let's rejoice and be glad and give glory to him because the marriage of the lamb has come and his bride has prepared herself. It was given to her to clothe herself in fine linen, bright and clean, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. And so, Lord, as we go into this, these passages, we thank you that there is a bride that will have prepared herself. 
I thank you, Holy Spirit, that this is your agenda in this hour to bring forth a prepared bride. That Ephesians 5 says that you're going to wash her with the water of your word, that you're going to remove every spot, every wrinkle. And I thank you that this is a house, this is a company of people that are wise virgins, that they are acquiring oil. And so, Lord, I thank you for every man and woman in here. I pray that you would mark us today in Jesus' name. And so I want to take a, a look at this harlot system for a minute. I'm just going to read some of the verses in Revelation 17 and 18. It says in, in chapter 17, verse 1, and I'm kind of going to just skip through it and share some a couple stories. Revelation 17, verse 1, I will show you the judgment of the great prostitute who sits on many waters, with whom the kings of the earth committed acts of sexual immorality, and those who live on the earth because they became drunk with the wine of her sexual immorality. I'm going to jump down. The name is Babylon the Great, the mother of prostitutes and of the abominations of the earth. And I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the witnesses of Jesus. And I'm going to jump over to chapter 18 when she falls. It says in verse 2, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. She has become a dwelling place of demons and a prison for every unclean bird and a prison for every unclean and hateful bird. For all the nations have fallen because of the wine of the passion of her sexual immorality and the kings of the earth had, have committed acts of sexual immorality with her and the merchants of the earth have become rich with the excessive wealth of her luxury. I heard another voice from heaven saying, come out of her, my people, so that you will not participate in her sins and receive any of her plagues, for her sins have piled up as high as the heaven, and God has remembered her offenses. Pay her back even as she has paid, and give her back double according to her deeds. In the cup which she has mixed, mix twice as much for her, to the extent that she has glorified herself and live luxuriously to the same extent, give her torment and mourning. And so there's this cry saying, come out of her, my people, lest you share in her plagues. Don't touch the system. And there's, there's this interesting season that we're, going, that we're entering into where it's going to become more defined and more distinct. And the bride is going to become the bride. And the harlot is the harlot. And right now, there's a lot of gray and a lot of mixture, but it's not going to be here for much longer. It's interesting that this, this harlot system is both a global worship movement. It's a global economic system. You know, we, we see in verse 11 that it's the merchants of the earth that are going to weep and mourn over her because no one buys anymore gold, silver. I mean, it lists everything, pearls, fine linen, wood, ivory, Every article, bronze, marble, cinnamon, spices, wheat, cattle, sheep, horses, but then slaves and human lives, human trafficking. I mean, it's going to be a huge issue at the end. And so there's this coming together of this harlot system. And, you know, the subtlety is shocking to me as a believer. I was in Hawaii a few years ago at a wedding um, of the girl that I grew up with who was my best friend. And there was a bunch of, of people um, who I had gone to school with. They were Youth with a Mission, is the, the missions organization I grew, grew up in. And a couple of the kids were, uh, a couple of the, the men and women were children of the leaders back in the day. So just a lot of my old friends. And I remember getting into a conversation with a gal who had married a guy who was high up in YWAM. And, and I was talking to her, and I was already weeping in my spirit because the whole setting of, of the wedding, there was just so much of this spirit of harlotry. There was drinking from the time they all arrived till the, day, till the wedding, and there was just that I could feel this spirit of harlotry. And then I remember having a conversation with the gal who I, who I used to know, and she said, you know, what are you doing now? And I told her, and I said, what are you doing? And she said, I'm a part of, a, of one of the biggest, I don't even remember the name, one of the biggest anti-trafficking movements. I said, oh, that's awesome. 
and she said, we're based in Africa now. And, and, but then as she started explaining it, she said, you know, this is something unique, Katie. She said, I've never been a part of a group like this where she said, all the religions are coming together. I said, what? <laughs> and, and she was being seduced into this system that was all humanitarian, all about what man can do and what can we do in our own strength, our own ingenuity, and she had been subtly seduced into this. And when I looked at her and said, there's no justice apart from Jesus, her response was actually, oh, Katie, you've become so religious. And it was so subtle the way she was enticed because her heart was enticed by this humanitarian, we're gonna, we are gonna actually get these girls out, we're gonna save them. It was this vigilante spirit of, it's false justice. And so there's a whole narrative in this harlot Babylon system that's going to actually mock the body of Christ, mock the true bride, because there's, there's, there's a thought process, you know, what, what she was explaining of, we're doing good, and it's all about what we can do. <laughs> what can man do? What can we build? You know, the whole harlot system is what man can do at the peak, and the Lord's going to bring it down in one hour. I mean, that's, that's the beauty of our God is he's going to say, now it's done and in one hour and her smoke's going to rise forever. But it's subtle. You know, as, as you guys were all praying over here, I was, I felt like the Lord was reminding me that, and we've gone through with you guys, so I'm, I want to take us a, a, a step deeper because we've gone through the 16 demonic spirits but I want to narrow in a little bit today in trying to bring more understanding to how the spirit of harlotry operates because of all the different demonic spirits, the demonic strongholds, I never felt like harlotry had an inroad into, into my life. But then after my husband passed away, the Lord called me to take my wedding ring and throw it. I shared that story last time. And to trust in nothing but him. And so I remember releasing that. But then about a year later, almost a year later, it was Christmas time. And, and I remember we brought down all the Christmas boxes to decorate the house. And I'd never had an experience like this where I know that it, it was a demon that manifested on me, in me, whatever. There was something demonic that manifested because I was with my children, we were all together, and it was sweet, all of us just being together, but then suddenly there was this sorrow that came and this, this chronic dissatisfaction, like what are we doing anyway? And it was the first Christmas without my husband being there, but I could feel that what was happening in my heart was, it was something demonic was manifesting. And I discerned it, even though my emotions were, I was crying, I was feeling really off. We were hanging all these ornaments, and it was triggering something. And I paused everything, and I said, you guys, let's sit down and pray. And, and it was just the Holy Spirit led me to pray. I said, Jesus, this season is about you. It's not about me anyway. <laughs> this is about you. Let us enter in and, and see you. And suddenly everything shifted, and there was joy in the house again. But what I realized was there were things that I threw away about three-fourths of the Christmas stuff that year. Now, I want to make something clear. <laughs> it's things aren't demons, but there's a lot of material things that, that wind up being a distraction that demons can actually influence and operate off of. Because after that experience, like I got delivered from something that day just by throwing away a bunch of stuff. And, and then I became more sensitive that during COVID, I remember I went into this, this experience with the Lord. I've never had an experience like this where I woke up, it was one week into, you know, the COVID thing was announced, and I heard Jesus singing let my people worship me, let my people worship me. And I knew he was inviting the body of Christ. He was shutting down the world. He was inviting us to enter in. 
And I knew he wanted to remove the idols in the heart of his people. And I, and I remember during that time, he led me to focus on my home, to, to get my home back to a place where it's a place of encounter, where it's clean. And I remember getting rid of two-thirds of the stuff in my house. And it wasn't all bad stuff, you guys. It wasn't, it wasn't even that it was bad. Like, I remember him having me just clean out and get rid of because there was, there was a distraction with some of it. There was an enticement with some of it. And he said, I want simplicity. I want your heart to be mine. I want your home to be the place where, where my presence can dwell. And when we did that, my kids, something shifted in all of my children where all of a sudden it's like a worship anointing fell on, on my children. And my daughter, who had just come back from Japan, this it, it's like she had never touched an instrument in her life or sang, and suddenly she was gripped to lead worship. So we went and bought her a guitar, yeah. and within a few weeks, she looked online, and she started leading us. I remember she came to me right before Easter, and she said, Mom, let's have a time of family worship. She said, I'll play the guitar. She couldn't do both because she was just learning. She goes, you sing, and I'm not a singer. I go, okay. <laughs> and then suddenly... We started having these times of family worship, and it was broken. I mean, she was just learning, and that, but the presence of God started resting at our home again, and the anointing fell on my boy, and, and he picked up the violin in that season, and suddenly he's able to play it, and within a couple years, he was just accepted again into the Kansas City Youth Symphony, and his prayer from last year to this year, he was at the bottom level, this year, he just got accepted to the top level. And it's like this, this anointing started coming of, of worship. And it really is about an end-time worship movement. At the end, people are going to be worshiping. The bride is going to be worshiping Jesus, entering into intimacy and fellowship with Jesus. Or it's a harlot bride worshiping Satan and following the Antichrist. There's not going to be any gray left. And so we see this picture in Revelation 17 and 18, and the cry, the voice from heaven saying, come out of her, my people. Come out of her. So I want to keep looking at a couple more passages. You could turn back to Daniel 11. You know, we see just insight into the Antichrist, and he, he operates exactly how Satan operates. You know, the Dan's, I'm not going to try and break it down, because I think Dan's going to break it down more when he talks on authority, but the foundation of everything that Satan does, everything he builds upon, the foundation would be from pride and jealousy. And... When that's the foundation, seduction can just flow. So that pride, that jealousy, that seduction would be the core of how he operates. And if he can hook the human heart, that's what, that's what lures people into the spirit of harlotry. And so we see that the Antichrist is going to be filled with this, I mean, filled with Satan's power, but it's going to be a very seductive spirit. It's very subtle. You know, it's, it's very subtle. It's this flattering tongue that actually will entice. I'm sure you guys have watched old documentaries on, on Hitler even where, where people who are still alive testify like his words had power in a dark way. It was very subtle the way he was able to manipulate and seduce. And so in Daniel 11:21 21, it says, In this place, a despicable person will arise on whom the majesty of kingship has not been or has been confirmed, and he will come in a time of tranquility and seize the kingdom by intrigue. It's subtle. You jump down in verse 23, he will practice deception. You jump down to 24, he will devise his schemes. If you go down to 31, 32, and he will do away with regular sacrifice, and they will set up the abomination of desolations. And by smooth words... 
He will turn to godlessness those who act wickedly. And so it's smooth words. It's the power of seduction. It's deception that's going to seduce a people into this harlot system and then beyond. But I love this. It says, but the people who know their God will be strong and take action. And those who have insight among the people will give understanding to many. Yet they will fall by sword and by flame, by captivity, and by plunder for many days. And so there's this reality that there will be a people who give understanding to many. And they're going to be the ones, this, this verse makes it clear that they're going to be the ones who've surrendered everything because they are going to be martyred. Many will be martyred. You know, I think parallel with this passage, I'm going to read one more and then I'm going to focus in on Hosea 2 for a minute. <clears throat> because this is connected to Daniel 11, 2 Thessalonians 2. And the one, no one is to deceive you in any way, for it will not come unless the apostasy comes first and the man of lawlessness is revealed. <clears throat> so we see that the arising of the Antichrist, the son of destruction who, oppo who opposes and exalts himself above every so-called God or object of worship. And so he's filled with pride, and he's going to pose every other form of worship. There's going to be a spirit of pride and jealousy operating. And, but here's the warning. Verse 9, it tells us that is the coming of the lawless one, the coming, uh, the one who's coming is in accord with the activity of Satan, with all power and false signs and lying wonders, and with all the deception of wickedness for those who perish because they did not accept the love of the truth so as to be saved. <clears throat> and there's going to be a people that can't even discern the lying signs and wonders because they haven't received the love for the truth. You know, what are these signs and wonders onto? Is it exalting Jesus or is it exalting a man? And it says in verse 12, in order they might be judged, they did not believe the truth but took pleasure in wickedness. Okay. So with that in mind, I want to I want to go to Hosea. So in the book of Hosea, Hosea had an interesting assignment from the Lord. It says in Hosea 1:2, then the Lord spoke to Hosea. The Lord said, "Hosea, go take for yourself a wife inclined to harlotry or infidelity." and children of harlotry, because the land commits flagrant harlotry, abandoning the Lord. And so Hosea, we all know the story, he marries a prostitute because the Lord says, you're going to actually feel what my heart feels about my harlot bride. You're going to actually be able to speak out of experience because this is what I feel every time my people are going after lesser idols. Every time my people are worshiping other things, giving themselves to lesser things, this is what my heart feels. I feel torn. And so Hosea does that. And then the Lord says to him, going into chapter 2, I will make her like a wilderness. I will make her like a desert land. I will put her to death with thirst. The Lord is going to allow I think these birth pains that are actually coming to planet Earth, it's going to allow the true bride to get desperate and thirsty until we actually enter in. He said, for, I, for she said, I will go after my lovers who give me my bread and my water, my wool, my flax, my oil, my drink. Therefore, behold, I will obstruct her way with thorns. The Lord's going to allow difficulties. He's going to allow thorns. He's going to allow hedges. He's going to allow trials so that we, there's a desperation, there's a hunger in, in the heart of his people. He says, I will build a stone wall against her so she cannot find her paths, and she will pursue her lovers, but she will not reach them. You know, and the interesting thing about people that, that give in to this spirit of harlotry, it's 
the, the primary fruit that this spirit produces in a person's life is chronic dissatisfaction. You know, it's the feeling. I remember one time I was walking in Southern California in one of the most wealthy areas that I had been down there, in these multi-million dollar homes. And it was the middle of the day, so people were probably at work or whatever. Everything was perfection. It was right on the coast, and it was beautiful, but you could feel the spirit hovering, and it was just this feeling of chronic dissatisfaction. Like, they had reached the peak of what they can do in their own strength, their own ingenuity, their own human willpower, and nothing satisfies. You reach that peak, and nothing satisfies. And so it says, she'll pursue her lovers, but she'll not reach them. It's this constant seeking. She'll seek them, but she won't find them. Then she will say, I will go back to my first husband because it was better for me then than now. Yet she does not know that it was I myself who gave her the grain, the new wine and the oil. And I lavished on her silver and gold, which they used for Baal. And so the Lord's saying, I'm still the one who's given everything, even though they've used it for their Baals. You know, the interesting thing, if you, if you look up the meaning of Baal, and I want to I wanna make this point, in the Canaanite religion, Baal was the most active god. They had a whole collection of gods. And Baal was their most active god in this context, in, in Hosea. It was he, as a divine husband, that was actually the meaning. The meaning of Baal was lord, owner, or husband. It was, this, it was this bowing to these idols that would provide for them. And this divine husband would give the land fertility through these religious rites. You know, some of them were, were sexual, some of them were not. But there were these, these rites that they had to do in order to gain. And so that's why we're going to jump ahead. But it's a perverse picture of a husband who provides. And... Jump over to verse 14. So the Lord says, therefore, behold, I'm going to persuade her. He's talking about the harlot bride, the bride who's given in to other things. I'm going to bring her into the wilderness, and I'm going to speak kindly to her. That where she was actually seduced into dark things, he's going, I'm going to come and allow her to be in that place of wilderness. And I believe COVID was round one of that. Yes. Yes. I think there's more coming. There's more birth pains coming that's going to allow the church to respond again. You know, I saw some people respond in that season and go deep in the things of the Lord. Others didn't know what to do in that season. But he's actually wooing his people out of the place of idolatry. He's kind in the midst of all these other idols. He actually woos us. He says, I'm going to go into that place of the wilderness. I'm going to speak kindly to her. And then I will give her vineyards from there, and the Valley of Acre is a door of hope. <clears throat> and she will respond there as in the days of her youth, as in the days when she went up from the land of Egypt. And then Hosea does, does this interesting thing. He prophesies about the end-time bride. He says, and it will come about on that day, declares the Lord, that you will call me my husband, and you will no longer call me my Baal. For I will remove the names of the bales from her mouth so that she will no longer be mentioned by their names. And so I remember the Lord had me in this passage um, for that year right after my husband passed away. So that was 2019 going into 2020. And I felt like the Lord, because I had been really meditating on the bride being prepared and I felt like the Lord said, Katie, pay attention to the timing indicator because I'm, I'm narrowing in. I'm going to focus in this season. And I felt like the Holy Spirit was about to move in a new way to draw the bride into this reality, into the wilderness to actually remove the bales from her mouth, bring revelation of who we are as the bride, who he is as husband. <clears throat> and so... When I looked at this, I thought, how interesting the symbolism, because 2020 on the Hebrew calendar was the year of the mouth. Yeah. And here, the year of the mouth, suddenly COVID and masks are put over our mouths. Yeah. Now, we know that that plagues disease, that doesn't come from God. I mean, Satan was having his way, but God 
is using everything. And so I felt like the Lord was saying, I'm allowing the mouth of the church to be shut right now because she has bales in her mouth. And I need to remove the idols from her mouth and from her heart. And I feel like it really was a timing indicator of this passage where he was saying, I'm going to do it. I'm actually going to remove the idols. I'm going to deliver her from a spirit of harlotry. And I'm going to raise up a prepared bride. And so it says, they're going to call me husband. They're not going to call me Baal. In verse 19, I will betroth you to I will betroth you to me forever. I will betroth you to me in righteousness and in justice and favor and compassion. I will betroth you to me in faithfulness, and you will know the Lord. Again, it's that difference between knowing of him and knowing the Lord, that he becomes husband, that place of intimacy. And I feel like this, this verse 16, 17 about him removing the bales, I believe that as, as the body of Christ, I believe that there's been a lot of things worshipped that are not Jesus, that we've worshipped human giftedness. Yeah. We've, we've, you know, we've worshipped a brand instead of the man, yeah. Yeah. you know, and he's not going to, he's not going to, <laughs> he's a jealous bridegroom. And so there's a place where he's, he's not going to um, agree with that. He's going to remove it. And idols keep us from experiencing his love. I mean, that's the bottom line. You know, the spirit of harlotry really hooks the human soul and pulls men and women into bondage to earthly things. Idols captivate the human heart, and that's why it just blocks intimacy. We, it, we become, it becomes, it brings this dullness. It brings a dullness. Now, I feel like when I was in this passage in Hosea 2, the Lord took me in that season to really dial down and focus on um, looking at someone who is an example in scripture of someone who walked in the bridal identity as a, as a forerunner. And I believe it's, it's the Apostle John, I think is a real clear picture. And I want to read, I'm going to turn to 1 John 5 real quick, and then I want to just share a few things before we pray. So we know that John was the one who, at the supper, the Last Supper, was leaning on the breast of Jesus. He was the one who went to the cross when everybody else ran away. I mean, John, to me, is, is someone, it's a picture of someone who walked in the bridal identity. You know, and John wanted to be known by how he related to Jesus, not by what he accomplished before men. And I want to break that down a little, but I want to read this verse first. At the end of, of he gives us a warning. First John 5, um, I'll just read 19 to 21. We know that we are of God and that the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. And we know that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding. I feel like that's parallel to that Daniel 11:33, where people who he's given understanding so that we may know him who is true and we are in him who is true in his son Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. And he ends his book with little children keep yourself from idols. He warns them at the end, keep yourself from idols because he knows what that spirit does. It will block us from the knowledge of God. I mean, Hosea 4 talks all about that. They, they, had, they had a blocking from the knowledge of God. And so John, if we look at John, it's interesting to me that he's the one who outlived everyone as well and gets the book of Revelation and explains the whole harlot system. I mean, he's, he's shown everything. 
So the intimacy, I believe, is, is what allowed him to enter in because he wasn't enticed by title, by things of this world. He wanted to be known by who he was before God, not what he did before people. Because if you look at the, the resume of John, he did amazing things. You know, he wrote five books of the Bible. Jesus looks at him and says, you take care of my mother. I mean, his name is going to be, you know, on the wall of New Jerusalem. He's going to be sitting on a throne. He was a part of the early revivals. I mean, the guy had a big resume. But if you go through the book of John, five times he says over and over, he never uses his name once. He says, I'm the one that he loved. I'm the one Jesus loved. And I think it, it gets summarized in this verse at the end of John, in John chapter 21, verse 20. So John is writing this. He says, Peter turned around and saw the disciple who Jesus loved following them, the one who had also leaned back on his chest at the supper and said, Lord, who is the one betraying you? And so what he's saying is, I'm the one he loves, I lean on his heart, and he tells me his secrets. That's a picture of the bride of Christ. That's a picture of the end time bride, and I feel like the body right now, believers who are positioning their hearts, the Holy Spirit is depositing this oil of intimacy that we would walk like John walked. And, and it's interesting that in the midst of everything, the Lord kept him to the full span of life as long as the Lord wanted him there. And he brought understanding to us of the end times. And so, yeah. I feel like the Lord wants to mark us in this room with that, with what John carried in, in the fact that he was a forerunner of the bride. You know, we know that at the end it says the spirit and the bride say come. And now corporately we're a bride, which is why I love that this house is a company of people coming together. And the Lord is drawing people who have a heart connect, who have a fear of him. It's that, that Malachi is at the end of chapter 3 or the beginning of chapter 4 where those who fear the Lord came together and a book of remembrance was written. I believe that, that in the midst of this great falling away, there's a coming together of the bride that's happening. And it's, it's divine. It's supernatural. You know, that's why Dan was saying that he knows where he's supposed to go in this season to companies of people where it's the true bride that the Lord's rising, raising up. And he's setting people ablaze. There's these little fires that are starting to happen all over the place. And it's the true bride of Christ. And so um, I want us to just take a moment this morning to position our hearts. And um, we can wait before the Lord and allow him to show us if there's any way that we have still allowed a spirit of harlotry to um, operate in our lives, because I feel like the Lord wants to free our hearts to such an extent that we can, we can live in this place of intimacy and a flow with the Holy Spirit. So we can enter into a little, Dan, do you have anything you wanted to say, any, res any response? Do you want to add anything? It is because if the enemy can keep the bride divided, she'll never be the bride. Because individually, we're sons and daughters of God, we're friends of God. Every expression in scripture that talks about the bride, it's a corporate bride. It's the body coming together, being one bride in unity with Christ. And so I think the assignment of the enemy against the bride is, is jealousy, division, and it's very subtle. Because it's it's a simple thought of you don't you know you don't you're not like that person. Why does she have 
the position? Why am I not gifted like that? Why da da da? And it fuels idolatry because it's it's constantly causing us to look at temporal things. It's causing us to look at at secondary things, giftedness, talent, anointing, instead of keeping our eyes fixated on Jesus. And so that spirit of jealousy and harlotry, all the demons are, you know. But those two, we feel, have primarily come against House of Prayer movement because it's all about worship. It's all about the bride being prepared to worship, to call forth <laughs> Jesus, his second coming. And if, if the enemy can keep the house divided, then the bride can't come together and partner with the Holy Spirit to say, come Lord Jesus. And so we have to be aware of, of how the enemy operates. You know, I noticed, I think Dan and I were talking last night. I walked in, and because I'm so used to it, because I just have been doing deliverance for <laughs> however long now, I had this thought come of comparison. And so I knew right away, that's not me. So I took authority over it. And then I was able to enter in last night. He said he had a thought come against him. And then I talked to a couple others. And it's, it's, it's these thoughts of, wait, I don't measure up like that person. That person got the anointed word. Why am I this? The beauty this morning of all of your prayers coming together released the anointing in the room. I mean, that was the power of the power of a unified bride will be explosive. It's like, you know, sometimes in our in our intensives back home, we do a skit to try and give a visual where I try and paint the picture that everything that Satan builds upon is pride and jealousy. And it's in the church right now. And it can't be <laughs> because the bride won't have it. And people always argue about it. I'm like, no, they, they won't. A lot of leaders I've talked to go, well, there will always be pride and jealousy. I go, no, there won't. Because what it looks like is, is a bride prepared, if that's existing, you picture people lo you know, linking arms. If they're in agreement with pride and jealousy and idolatry, looking at giftedness and anointing and this, and they're in agreement with that, it's going to be chaos. You know, James 3.16 where, where pride and jealousy or selfish ambition and envy exist, there will be confusion in every evil thing. And so the picture is, you know, if that's existing, it's a bride falling apart. It's not a prepared bride. But a bride delivered from that, unified, will be a force and a strength. And so we really need to be aware of how the enemy operates. You know, in 2 Corinthians to, is it 11 or 9? I think it's 11. We're not unaware of the devil's schemes. Like, we need to be aware of the way that he targets. And, and primarily, I believe that that spirit of jealousy would target houses of prayer worship movements because it's all about <laughs> a worship movement. I mean, Satan, Lucifer, started out as a worship leader. He was the anointed cherub who covers. I mean, he was, he was in the midst of... And he is jealous. That's why it's a murderous spirit. Anything that he can do to, to break up or keep us away from intimacy and entering in is what he's after. And so I think we can go into a time of really bowing before the Lord and taking authority over any spirit of pride, jealousy, I think seduction and harlotry that have tried to come into this house because I want to see this house become the unified bride that can move in authority and power. I just, uh, this is a big one for us. And uh, I just so we we so we do this in faith and understanding. Um, I think we should just go slow with this. Could you just I don't know maybe summarize what the spirit of harlotry is so we know so we can examine it and our, examine our own hearts. You know I don't want to just I don't I don't want to forget anything because I want it all out. You know so 
maybe just summarize what is the spirit harlotry, and we can just renounce that. And because I agree, there, especially in the Dallas Fort Worth area, there's such a spirit of comparison here. I mean, with ministries and, and social media, just intensifies the whole thing. It's like everyone kind of puts their best, you know, expression of who they are, and it's. I don't see Jesus in it, and you know, and, I, and we've been guilty of it too. But we just want to have understanding, you know, so we can do this. Right. So I think the way that I see, you know, the demons have different assignments to come against us, and so when we're specifically referring to a spirit of harlotry in Hosea, it references a spirit of harlotry, which primarily means they've gone after other idols other lovers and it can be anything i think in the body of christ i think many of the primary idols have been we've idolized giftedness we've idolized uh, anointing we've idolized and and there's a tension because we because some people then give into seduction and either go with control and manipulation and try and use it in a wrong way or there's an Ahab spirit where they pull back and they don't want anything to do with it. And so there's this, this reality that takes place. But I think it's ultimately an idol is anything that we put our trust in that isn't ultimately Jesus. It's anything that winds up being worshipped in the place of Jesus. And, and we may not think of the sense of worship, but anything that that we are giving our time to that's enticing us that that would lure us away from Jesus being our first love first commandment first and and so oftentimes the the idolatry can be our own talent our own giftedness and the danger is you know the lord wants us to walk in our secondary identity the gifts he's given us the anointing the call whatever but it has to be secondary and I think the the dysfunction in a lot of the body has it's become primary and it's gotten out of balance because people have idolized. And I think because of that, I think that spirit of jealousy is able to operate where it's it's um, I mean, ultimately behind the spirit of jealousy, it's a murderous spirit. It wants to kill the gifting, the calling, the anointing on someone's life. You know, if you look in the book of Acts, it, it talks, I mean, there's, there's a few different references, but it talks about, we see how Joseph was thrown in prison because of, of envy, you know, the apostles were taken in because of envy. I mean, Jesus, it talks about when he went before Pilate, they weren't even unaware. I mean, it says Pilate knew they'd handed him over because of envy or jealousy. You can interchange the words. It's a murderous spirit. The demon wants to entice a person to become envious of the gifting, the calling, the anointing on another person. And whether it be a natural talent or, you know, a spiritual gift, whatever, but it tries to pin people against each other. And so they all kind of operate together, you know, because if, if people have given themselves over to a spirit of harlotry where there's idols, there's a place where... where it's blocking intimacy with Jesus, so it's affecting their identity, and then it's going to allow that spirit of jealousy to operate a lot easier. Does that make sense? Do you want to speak anything into this? Okay. And so, right, right, and when we expose the way they operate, they can't hide. And when we become aware, because we were talking yesterday that, you know, I've, I've talked to a lot of people who start beating themselves up because they go, I don't want to be jealous anymore. I just had, you know, I was in the place and, and I suddenly had this jealous thought. I was, I was jealous against this person that, you know, I've heard a thousand things. Um, and I pause them and I say, if you can discern, if you can stop and realize it's not you, these are demons that bring thoughts to try and get you to agree. But if you can discern when the thought comes of like, wait, I just showed up and I feel like 
the Lord's using that person, not me. Why am I not being used? Why was she promoted? Why does that person look better than me today? Why, you know, all these little things that would cause suspicion, that would, would cause comparison. If we can realize when those thoughts come, we can pause and say, that's a demon. And actually take authority and say, I command you to leave me. Jesus, thank you who I am in you. Thank you that I'm the one that you love. <laughs> you know, that's why we need the oil. That's why we need to enter in the way John did, that John had so, he was so solidified in his identity that he was not swayed by the spirit of jealousy and harlotry, <clears throat> that with the resume the guy had, he could have said, I'm the one who wrote five books. I'm the one who he said is going to be on the, the wall in Jerusalem. I'm the one who's going to sit on a throne. I'm the one who was a part of the revivals. He said, I'm the one he loves. <laughs> and he wrote the book, most scholars say, in his 90s. So this was after everything that he goes, I'm the one he loves. And that's all he wanted to be known for. He wanted to be known for who he was before God, not what he did before man. And if we can get to that place, then those demons have no power. We can discern them real quick and say, get away from me. You have nothing to do with me. And so I think we can just enter in. As, as we come before the Lord, I'm just going to read a couple of verses out of Song of Solomon. And I want the word to just wash us. And I want us to repent. But go ahead, Dan. So you know that this spirit of harlotry pride, jealousy, seduction is operating when you can't rejoice when God is flowing for those around you, through those around you. You know you're not under the influence of these spirits when your heart soars when God is using someone, but you're definitely being influenced by these spirits when you want to draw back when God's using someone. So we've got to get to the place, you guys, where all we want is intimacy with Jesus. Because when that is your one desire, then you rejoice continually no matter who God is using. Because we're all one body in that moment. And so we rejoice. He's using the finger today. He's using the ear today. He's using the, you know, the, the toenail today. It's like if all we want to be is the one that he loves... That, that solves the problem. So he's just after intimate lovers, you guys. And it's not just a culture where we have a certain kind of music and we're comfortable with, okay, we're going to pray in the spirit for a while. We're going to get on our face. It's not that at all. It's your heart posture. He's roaming the earth, not looking for certain cultures of people. He's roaming the earth looking for hearts. And so your heart, when it becomes one with him, you're in, you, you will be invincible and impervious to the devil's schemes. So, Kate, I just think we just need to pray. Yeah. We'll just pray into it. Yeah, let's just pray into it. I want to start out. Um, do we want a little music? Oh, thank you. Just put out your hands. I want to read a couple verses from Song of Solomon, chapter 8. And Jesus, we just declare right now that our strategy moving forward is you. It's you, Jesus. Jesus, I thank you that you're the one singing this over your bride right now. It says in Song of Solomon 8, verse 5, who is this coming up from the wilderness leaning on her beloved? Lord, we thank you that the victorious bride will be leaning on her beloved that she's going to come up out of the wilderness leaning on her beloved. Lord, I thank you that in this hour you've been releasing a river of fire that's cleansing and water that's washing. I thank you that your word says, put me like a seal over your heart, like a seal on your arm, for love is as strong as death. Jealousy as severe as Sheol, its flames are a flame of fire the flame of the Lord. Many waters cannot quench love, nor will rivers flood over it. If a man were to give all the rich of, riches of his house for love, it would be utterly despised. That this is going to be the revelation of your bride. 
all the things that we have, all the talent, Lord, that it would be utterly despised because of love. Lord, I thank you that love is as strong as death. Jesus, you went to the cross. You gave everything for your bride. And so I thank you, Lord. I pray that you would mark us today, that you would put your seal upon our hearts right now. Lord, I thank you that your word starts with a seal upon our heart. And then it's our strength. Then it's a seal upon our arm. But Lord, we ask that you would seal our hearts. The first commandment first, our primary identity first, our spiritual identity first, who we are before you first. Put your seal upon our heart. And the Lord, I thank you that you do seal our arms, our strength, that you put your seal upon what we do. But you start with our hearts. So I pray that you would show us right now if there's anything in our hearts that is not in alignment with you, I pray that you would show us any place that we have agreed with a spirit of harlotry, with jealousy, with pride, with seduction.